Hi everyone, thanks for ringing in today. So yeah, it's great to be um, asked to uh, co-chair this lecture, uh, a real field of interest for me. Um, many, many years ago, I did a PhD uh, in remapping HIV and AIDS incidents in Eastern Europe to uh, look at missing data. So uh, this looks like a fascinating field for me from uh, Brown's chat earlier. Um, just as a brief bio, uh, I've been a civil service for 20 years. Um, I'm an analyst and I've worked in a wide range of areas uh, from modeling the impact of employment programs, redesigning and managing the NHS st staff survey uh, and developing models to help the government recover more benefit over payments and lately returned to the field of uh, health in the UK HSA uh, to promote the use of innovative um, analytic techniques and software. Uh, so, as I say, a real field of interest for me this and I'd just like to briefly introduce um, the work of uh, the Turing Institute and the RSS. So uh, the two institutes came together at PACE in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and have provided world-class independent research and modeling expertise to the UK government. Um, researchers have come together uh, working with us, the UK Health Security Agency to provide insight and guidance and expertise in the dynamic and changing environment. Uh, this partnership has played a really valuable role in developing and further enhancing the data science and advanced analytical capabilities within UK HSA. So it's fantastic to um, continue this series of lectures. Uh, and I, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sylvia. Good afternoon and welcome. I add my welcome to Phil's to the, today's lecture. So I'm Sylvia Richardson. I'm one of the technical directors of this Turing RSS Health Data Lab uh, in partnership with UKHSA. I'm a professor of biostatistics at the University of Cambridge and currently president of the Royal Statistical Society. So this um, health data lab, our health data lab started in October, 2020, with as Phil was saying, the mission to support uh, UK HSA and UK health security through an embedded data science collaboration, uh, working towards an interoperable framework to provide a trusted quantitative evidence to decision makers. And we're involved in a number of projects. And if you're interested, um, to learn more about this project and our outputs that I can see that Dee has just put in the chat, um, the lab website, so please uh, have a look. As part of our community engagement uh, side, we have organized an international seminar series and today's our seventh lecture since the beginning, which will be delivered by Professor uh, Brahma Mukherjee. So Brahma, who I know personally, and I'm very happy to, to welcome today, is the John Kaiprash College Professor and Chair of the Department of Biostatistics and the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She has a very impressive CV, co-authored co uh, more than 300 publications in statistics, biostatistics, medicine, and public health, and has received many awards, one most recently, uh, the Janet Norwood Award for Outstanding Women in Statistics, and I think it's really fantastic. Um, on top of uh, being chair and involved in a huge number of grants uh, in, in the US, uh, Rama and her team have got involved, uh, like, you know, basically the whole statistical community throughout the world, um, in um, modeling uh, COVID um, trajectory, and she got involved with um, India and in helping them. And so her work has led to publication and uh, has been picked up by a major media outlet. And there's a link to her full biography in, in the chat. So I'm not going to take more time in that, but I'm very, very pleased and we'll hear all her experience of, of setting up that collaboration. Um, and I'm very glad uh, that she's accepted to talk and I'm now handing over to her. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Richardson, for the kind introduction and to the organizers for inviting me to present in this distinguished lecture series. Uh, today, I want to share some of our experience of modeling the pandemic in India over the last two years. Uh, but before I begin, 
I just want to take a moment to acknowledge Professor Richardson for being an inspirational role model for many researchers like me. And I'm very, very glad that I would get a chance to visit uh, Professor Richardson at MRC Biostatistics Unit this fall for my sabbatical. And I hope to connect with many of my colleagues in the UK. Uh, I'd like to start with a quote by a trailblazing statistician from uh, another generation, Dr. Janet Norwood, uh, who was the first female commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States and fought tirelessly as a civil servant to improve the official data system. More than 25 years ago, she emphasized in this quote in Statistical Science about the necessity of high quality, real time, time statistical series or data, state of the art models, and dynamic statistical agencies to govern policymaking. The pandemic has really emphasized these principles once again for us. We need to stay prepared with a robust and comprehensive public health data system. Good data coupled with good models is really at the heart of effective policymaking. The partnership between the Turing Institute, the Royal Statistical Society, and the UK HSA is really an exemplar embodiment of what Dr. Norwood envisioned in terms of brilliant data scientists and modelers and mathematicians and statisticians coming together to solve the most pressing problems with health data. I want to congratulate all of you for being a part of this intellectual synergy. In the remainder of this talk, I just want to make three points. The first is to give you a sense of how we got started on this maddening modeling journey. The second is to share a data-driven framework for thinking about effectiveness of public health interventions, in particular in a populated country like India. The last is to emphasize that we have many, many good models, but most importantly, we really need good data particularly for low and middle income countries where the data infrastructure is not so robust. Data denial, data opacity, and data paucity have really hindered effective policymaking in India. One causal reason why I undertook this work is of course because of my roots as an immigrant scientist who came to the United States in 1996 from India to study statistics. The work that I'm presenting today is really the collective effort of a large number of individuals, many of whom, like me, came abroad to study statistics, but have their origin and their family in India. I want to acknowledge all of them. This project really gave us a purpose and strength to come together and stay connected in the early days of isolation in this devastating pandemic. In a sense, it was much more of an altruistic community project than a scientific project. When we started the modeling, pandem modeling the pandemic in India in mid-March of 2020, India had about 500 cases and 10 deaths in total. The y-axis in this figure displaying daily reported cases, it's truly, truly in double digits. That's when we started. In a Medium article, we shared our initial projections. And the reason that we were very concerned about India was that the distribution of risk factors which were identified for COVID severity were prevalent in India. But on the other hand, India is a very young population. The median age in India is about 28 years. The healthcare infrastructure is quite fragile and the percentage of uninsured population is very high. So in a Medium article, we shared our initial projections for India because there is no time to wait for peer reviewed publications. Comparing India's trajectory to that of Italy and that of the US. At this point, there were no formal projections for any model available for India. Now I want to talk a little bit about the model that we used. The model that we used was an off the shelf Bayesian SIR model that my colleague Peter Song and his lab was using to model the initial outbreak in Hubei province. The model describes a stochastic system emitting dynamic transmissions across the susceptible infected and removed compartments over time. At any point in time, 
a member of the population could belong to either any of the three compartments, but the true population proportion, say theta s, theta i, and theta r, of falling in each of these compartments was unknown. So thus, it is very natural to posit a latent variable structure where the observed proportions, the yi and the yr, that, we, that were obtained from the daily counts being released by the health ministry are related to the latent population proportions, theta i and theta r, through a stochastic distribution. Now we have an observed bivariate time series, yit and yrt, that are autocorrelated over time, but then there is an underlying population prevalence process governed by thetas. So let us assume that we have a beta distribution for the observed proportion y given thetas and a variance parameter lambda. However, the true trivariate prevalence process, the population prevalence process, is a Markov process governed by the transmission dynamics across the compartments. These equations for the SIR model have become very familiar to us over the last one year. One of my students said, SIR is the new linear regression. The transmission from S to I is governed by the transmission parameter beta. The removal from compartment I is gov governed by the removal parameter gamma. The basic reproduction number that we hear a lot about is then the ratio of these two parameters, beta and gamma. To introduce autocorrelation between two successive thetas in the prevalence process, one can assume that theta t plus one given theta t at any time t has a Dirichlet distribution, where kappa is a scaling parameter for the dist distribution with a mean f. f is truly the underlying engine that emits this Markov process for theta, starting with an initial value theta naught, and then following the infection dynamics described above. This F is derived by Rangekata type approximation to solve discretized system of linear equations in a recursive manner. We assume that suitable priors on all other parameters described by tau. Since given this hierarchical structure, we can now describe a Bayesian ESIR model and an MCMC scheme to, it, that can be implemented through R, JAGS, or STAN to draw the samples from theta, but also from y given the past data. And we can also come up with predictive distributions for a time point t plus one to capital T or a time window. And we can generate prediction intervals for these counts as well as predicted daily incidences on day t. And that's exactly what we are doing. We are also providing posterior distribution for the parameters beta, gamma, and R naught. And that's the advantage of a Bayesian approach in terms of characterizing the uncertainty. Now, the question at that point in India was in this model, how do we actually model the public effect of public health interventions or in short PHIs in this talk? So the intervention effects of any kind of mitigation measures was going to be described by a function or a modifying schedule pi of t. And this could be facial covering, school closing, lockdowns. And this pi will really appear as a central character in my talk, quantifying the change in the probability of transmission from the infected to the susceptible. In the beginning days, and you can see that the pi is really modifying those transmission equations. So in the beginning days, we really made up values of this pi t to create intervention scenarios that will tell you what is going to happen, how is the case trajectory going to look like if you lifted lockdowns in a certain way, if you came back from lockdown very uh, cautious manner or in a moderately cautious manner or without any, in any attention. So, and also we also were talking about what, how long should the lockdown be? Should it be 21 days? Should it be 42 days? Should it be extended or not? So at that time, we had no idea the effect of interventions and we were just setting up fixed values or fixed functions for pi t over time, how the effect of an intervention is going to look like. So this work really received significant media attention 
And the next day, once we published the uh, Medium article, uh, it was quoted as a key piece of evidence while considering intervention strategies for India. So this was really um, led to India's early national lockdown, which is a controversial and highly debated action. So India's, so the paper, public, the Medium article was released on March 20th, and there was already discussion about India's uh, actions and public health interventions. So the India's historic national lockdown started on March 25, and the initial lockdown was a 21-day period. It was later extended to nine weeks. We saw many economic and social ramifications with the tragedy of the migrant workers unfolding with no transportation available to them to return to the villages and no jobs in the cities. There were attempts at social galvanization through lighting of lamps in every household in India to eliminate the gloom of sickness. We had the foresight actually to build an app that app updates relevant epidemiologic metrics for the nation and its states each day, including updated daily projections. The app has tirelessly been running for more than 750 days now and has become a go-to place for policymakers, epidemiologists, and media. I often get a call from the chairman of India's COVID task force to explain parameter choices that changed in the app. This app is probably the most important contribution we made as public health data scientists. So you can see, from data till May 15, that India had quite distinct three waves, one, one for each of these uh, of the variants. The wave two was the most lethal one in April to June of 2021. So uh, from a year ago, so I just compared from our app, we took this summary table a year ago in May of 2021, how the death and case numbers look like and where they are now. India actually really dealt very well with the third Omicron wave in terms of severity of COVID cases. The beauty of this app is also that I can show you the effective R trajectory or the test positivity rate on last week without bothering my graduate students. As you can see, you have India so far has reported 43 million cases and 524,000 reported deaths, and we'll come back to that reported number. But things are much better than last year, thanks to an amazing vaccine drive with nearly 2 billion doses administered. And this is not an easy feat. We continuously track not just India, but also its 36 states and union territories. And some of these states have very limited statistical capacity. And each day we publish this report that which has the summary quantities uh, which may be useful for all the states and multiple public health metrics. So, and we also provide a ranking of the states in terms of where the current state of the pandemic is. So now, now that I've described the initial context that we saw that this, because of this app, because of the longevity of the findings, that it's the same kind of modeling, then we improve the modeling, I'll come back to that. It has an amazing um, media attention from major media outlets, generating over 7,000 media clips and widespread India or international coverage. This has been really shocking and astonishing to me because I have been working in statistics for such a long time, but none of my papers probably made the impact that single medium article and this app actually made. So um, I want to really come back to thinking about pi of t. When we started two years ago, we did not know anything about pi of t. We cooked up values for pi of t or effect of public health interventions. But now worldwide, we have seen two years worth of data. So what have we learned about this pi of t? Because each and every one of these measures have crushing consequences and values to human life and uh, society. So for that, let us go back to India's second wave. Because India's second wave in 2021, I think, will be written in public health history. I told you about the first wave when there was an early national lockdown. 
But then in the second wave, there was the general sense of complacency that there is population herd immunity after the first wave and India has conquered the battle with the virus. A scathing Lancet editorial called it a self-inflicted national catastrophe. Uh, despite the cautionary warnings from many models, the rise of new variants and very low vaccination coverage, only about 2% at that time, the country did not rule out any appreciable PHIs. Instead, there are massive political rallies and religious gatherings without almost any usage of masks. So you might want to ask this question, that do public health interventions which were conceived for the Western world work in a dense population like India? How do you even conceptualize social distancing in a slum like Tharavi, where people, many people are living in, this, in a very small unit and using public latrines? So does face covering syndromic surveillance work alternatively? Here you can see that uh, health workers are checking temperature in every um, uh, slum dwelling. So when in March or April of 2021, we see that when some states like Delhi or Mumbai actually ruled out the public health intervention, there was actually an immediate drop in cases, but these were mostly lockdown type measures. So this indicates that some of these interventions are likely effective in India, but the key question is to figure out what is the optimal timing and what is, should be the composition of these public health interventions. Though there has been some work, and this is a very important statistical area to tease apart the effect of PHIs like face covering, school closing. And I have provided one recent reference here, which is by Shi Hong Lin's group. It is a JASA discussion paper. And we, need, we certainly need more work in this area to understand the effect of PHIs across geography and possibly really create a worldwide catalog of effect sizes of these PHIs in an unvaccinated population and a menu for dialing up or dialing down PHIs to aid policymaking. We recently proposed, and this paper uh, is going to appear in Science Advances this month, a tiered framework to introduce and lift PHIs in India that constitutes of three elements, launching triggers, these could be epidemiologic metrics or healthcare capacity or vaccination coverage or a combination of many of these. Tiers of public health actions, um, as you see, and, the, and they are color coded uh, based on their strength. And it could be basic PHI, a stre stre strengthening of the PHI, moderate lockdown and stringent lockdown. And then under each of these measures, what is the counterfactual projection for infections and deaths averted? So this is the framework with three ingredients. And how did we arrive at this framework and these estimates of this modifying schedule pi of t? So for example, let us look at the effective R trajectory for India during wave two. And one can escalate depending on different R threshold, just to give you a one metric, that if you decided that the R threshold will increase 1.2, I'll go to another tier and R, threshold increasing 1.4, I'll go to another tier, but this is of course a toy example. There are multiple metrics governing this escalation to different color-coded tiers. It is, has to be supported by many other metrics. But then it is very important to understand what is the composition of each of these tiers? What actually has to happen on the ground in terms of school closing, in terms of your recommendations, in terms of a humane rollout of PHIs, how with social protection, what has to happen in each of these tiers? So we worked with the team which really studied these interventions in, at a very granular level across India. For this example, this table really shows what was done in Maharashtra, the Western state of India, which has always reported the highest number of cases and deaths. The period of studies last March before the lockdown happened in Maharashtra. We really study these actions and try to map them to what kind of changes in RT and other public health metrics these actions led to. It's impossible to talk about causality here, as you know, that there are many other simultaneous things going on at the same time. But what we 
talk about is really studying different time periods and what actions took place in India and define each of these tiers. And I'm going to, sh I'm showing on this slide only the middle tier, what is the strength and non-lockdown PHIs. Then what we did was to really, just to give, go back to the example of Maharashtra, we analyzed what happened with this when these lockdowns were rolled out in terms of the case curve during wave two at different time points, different measures were rolled out and how did the case curve look? We then also studied the effective R trajectory during the same period and observed the changes in RFT. Finally, we are at a position where we can try to say estimate an effect of intervention effect pies as a relative change in R with introduction of these PHIs. So this is just one framework of really looking at the data and trying to estimate what kind of changes would you expect on the transmission curve if you rolled out these actions. So this actually gave us an ensemble of realistic pie schedules that were estimated from data. And we can criticize these choices as nothing will be really capturing all, all, all the processes that went on in a simultaneous way. So, but now what we can do is to create counterfactual curves. We take this tiered system and we have this, uh, this schedule of interventions that were actually rolled out in India in terms of different time points, but then argue that what is the real optimal time point to introduce this PHI. So we take this tiered system and generate counterfactual death curves had the PHIs been applied earlier, say in February when we first saw the uptick or in March. We find that with early and sustained lockdown or certain sustained interventions, one could avert nearly 200,000 reported deaths or more than 80% of the deaths uh, during this time. The timing is the key more than the strength of the PHIs. That's what we found. That mid-April rollout of public health interventions, even when even with lockdowns, was really too late. But if you act early, even with moderate interventions that were rolled out in India, you have a potential for effective control. Now, the same type of projections can be done for hospital or ICU beds to estimate what level of mitigation will allow the capacity to be not exceeded. Perhaps these are more relevant metrics for India, particularly for a vaccinated population moving forward. But this data is also very difficult to access at a granular level across geography. So um, in summary, uh, I, I just think that politics and public health have been really, really closely entangled in this pandemic. Uh, when we published this med archive draft about timely intervention, it got translated into memes that we were blaming the government of inaction. This is really an unavoidable discomfiture of working in this area and being vocal about data quality, data fidelity, and in particular, the tricky and very challenging and highly debated issue of public health interventions. So I want to come to my third point because I do want to uh, allow time for conversation that um, really I became a data activist writing in so many newspapers about the data quality in India. Uh, so I think that if you think about our models, the forecasting models, I think we should really be humble about what forecasting and all these types of exercises in terms of creating counterfactual scenarios with public health interventions can do. Because a good model at this point in time to capture the complexity of the pandemic will need various inputs, including uh, the evolution of the virus, a model for human behavior, a data on reinfection, cross immunity, breakthrough infection, a model for policy intervention and di transmission dynamics is only a component of it. Even if we really, really work hard with a great interdisciplinary team, it is a really a stochastic system in constant turmoil, always, always a few steps behind. So in later papers, we came up 
with more sophisticated models because we are not happy with the ESIR model. And we wanted to address imperfect testing in India because the, the quality of the tests that were being used many parts of the country were um, suboptimal. And, um, but more than increasingly complex model, more and more I have become a firm believer that even with a simple model, we need good data. There is really no shortage of many more complex models, compartmental, regression, hybrid, machine learning, but you cannot really model your way out of poor data. Now, I was very vocal, I'll just give you an example. I was very vocal about limited testing and the true inf extent of infections in India from the very early beginning, the early days of the pandemic. Uh, I was very criticized for saying that there is a one out of 25 infections are being detected in India. But later on, because this was something that we saw in the models from supplementary data, uh, but later on, one thing India did was to really do serial seroservice at the, with a nationally represented sample. And you could see that by July of 2021, 70% of India, that's 800 million infections, already before by the end of the Delta wave. And at that time, only 2% population was vaccinated. So I think that that one out of 25 or one out of 10 or 15, those numbers that were coming out of the asset inventory from the models, there's some method in this madness. I'd also like to comment on the death reporting in, in, in India, particularly in 2021, data from auxiliary sources, they just did not add up any study or any auxiliary data resource gave an underestimation factor of five to tenfold. We did a meta-analysis, but when you say such things, obviously you are criticized for these estimates. But now there are several studies by the WHO, by IHME, by the Economist on excess death estimates using subnational data, and every model have pointed out to really four to five million excess deaths when the, the reported death is half a million. So again, an order of eight to 10. And of course, we know that excess deaths are not just COVID deaths. They are a combination of various other pandemic related deaths and also delayed impact of COVID-19 itself. But these studies are incredibly important because we do want to know what is the total toll of the pandemic uh, just beyond the reported numbers. So I often feel that I have become a data activist in the last few uh, months or like the two years. I try to really write broad general articles in leading newspapers in India to raise awareness about the data gaps. And we can do better uh, for the next public health crisis. And India has incredible infrastructure in terms of information technology. And recently the government also announced many digital health programs with the common national digital ID to link records across systems. 70% uh, of India is rural and the deaths and the um, health events that happened outside hospitals, it's very hard to capture that. But without capturing that, you are only going to enhance the voice of the represented. The invisible will always remain invisible. In this case, selection bias is really related to policy. So I have been really putting forward these graphs in newspapers as a visual way of communication that uh, people do not understand and relate to equations as much. But when you actually show them their trajectories through uh, visualization, it's, it's really compelling. And I just think that we need to train our students more in terms of the three C's, which is so important for becoming a modern statistician, computation, collaboration, and communication, and in particular, visualization. So I think that right now in every country, we are flying blind because we really don't know what the extent of the infections are because none of my friends are reporting after home tests that who, who are having COVID. So I think it's incredibly important to track the pandemic and set up a surveillance system. Uh, we need a random sample of intentionally designed sequenced uh, sample of uh, na nationally chosen in India. It has really been daunting to estimate excess deaths because for any model, because only very sparse subnational data are available and nothing almost is available in terms of disaggregated counts, even by age and sex. I think this is absolutely essential. 
The linkage of testing, vaccination, sequencing, and clinical outcome data has not happened. Um, I have been really promoting and propagating this data wish list as a minimal data wish list for 2022 and hoping that someone uh, high up is listening. The integrated national data from Public Health England, NHS, UKHSA, the Clarlit Health Systems in Israel, the population-based registry in Denmark, they have been really exemplar and admirable. And that has led to key discoveries in this pandemic. I do think that we need similar digital and intellectual ecosystems across the world. Um, I would like to end my presentation with a quote by Dr. Naurud displayed on this slide. Um, as statisticians, uh, may we not be silent or quiet when we have something unique and important to say. I think it's not just enough to publish our science, it's important to publicize it as well. Good data, good models, good visualization and communication tools will remain an essential part of our toolkit, just like the medicine, just like the vaccine for the remainder of this pandemic. And I think these are incredibly important tools for staying prepared for the next one. So I want to thank all of you for your attention and I want to open up the floor for any questions that you may have. Oh, thank you very much, Brahma, uh, for this uh, um, enthusiastic presentation and, 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 and the massive impact that, that, you, that you had. Um, I, I could see, can I just uh, open, open uh, while people think of the question, do, do you feel you know you you the first wave somehow you know the the lockdown was done quite early and it, it had a, a good impact and then the second wave as you illustrated nothing was done do mm -hmm. how do you um but you must you were doing the same projection and people were doing the same analysis so so what happened was it just that you know, a, a lack of communication uh, or the, that the economic consequences were so severe of, of, of the first lockdown? Yes, yeah, so, so I think that there were, of course, severe consequences. I think the lockdown, India needed the initial lockdown, not just for reducing transmission, but I do think at that time they had nothing. They did not have the COVID care centers that were built up. They did not have basic, like, you know, escalated and uh, oxygen supply. I think that was the time to really ramp up the basic infrastructure to take care of people before uh, things got too bad. But India did a very good job in creating isolation centers, in, in, in increasing uh, COVID care centers, uh, in even in rural areas. I think that was incredibly well done. But I think what happened was this sense of uh, there is a lot of hypothesis around herd immunity, that a lot of people are already infected in India by the first wave. And also there is this, um, it, because the, the first wave peaked in September of 2020. And then October, November, December, January, February, things are quiet. And you're hearing about the uh, alpha variant and then the Delta variant, the new variant was, I think it was the detection and recognition that that could have very different properties. Um, there's some sense of complacency, hubris, non-challenge that, um, that, that led to this. But by February, I, I still remember February 14, Valentine's Day, my social media is flooded with all of these party pictures from my friends uh, on uh, just like, you know, getting over the pandemic and reuniting. And I see the R slowly creeping back to uh, crossing unity. And, and because people did not feel the immediate threat, even my parents said that I, I'm going to wait for the vaccine because the data from the vaccines are not still clear and there is no immediate threat, we'll let us wait for to get vaccinated. That's also huge, right? So the first vaccination started in January by April. It was very slow, the sluggish start to the vaccination program. And then um, I think this wave hit. And so the large unvaccinated population, rise of a new variant, I think it's a confluence of many things together. Um, but by the time people started acting the, and rolling out the interventions, 
it was too late, right? So, and that's what I would try to show that even the same things, if they really did early, even with much more modest intervention, but it's hard for policymakers, right? If you do it before people see it, then you are criticized. And then if you wait to see it and convince people, then it's too late. So it's like a Schrodinger seesaw almost, uh, but also there are elections and there are fiercely fought elections and nobody was going to change that. And there are religious gatherings. So there is a, there is a complete denial of data and advice from the scientific community. So I think by February, it was clear that a wave is coming, but the first real um, intervention was not until March 14, March 28th, that time period in Maharashtra, but nothing nationally was done. Phil? Yeah, thanks, thanks. I, I mean, fantastic presentation. Um, I've got a question. I, I, that, that last slide really fascinated me about the point about publicizing um, your findings. Did you did you find on a personal level that you when when you spoke to the media, did you become uh, something of a, a figurehead or, or a pariah? I know obviously in, in England we have people referring to people as Dr. Death and things like that when you're just talking about statistical modeling. So so interesting to hear your thoughts on on how as uh, statisticians and analysts, we can um, show ourselves better in the media and, and, and whether uh, fame is a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> That's a great question. And um, the, the, you know, tomorrow I'm giving a talk on public health communications. I'm just focusing on that public health communication piece. So I think that the the first initial when we had these projections in medium uh, article it was just more for doing something really as i said that the students are coming together and people are coming together but then when i saw that there was so little available in terms of apps and daily projections later on there were many many models in the early days there were not much so there was a need there but of course, I think you have to be, in statistical terms, robust and efficient when you are in front of the media. You cannot be, you have, you have, to, you have your skin in the game and you have to be very robust and resilient. And many of these criticisms are criticisms of policy, right? When you are quantifying preventable deaths, if an action was taken, it has major implications. Or when you are, all these reports are coming up saying that, the death under reporting in India from crematorium data, from excess death data, from newspaper tabulation, every obituary tabulation, everything is pointing. These are criticizing a data system. And I think that it is very hard to convince that we are in this process together to improve the system. It always comes as a defensive action, right? Because, but we know that these are data gaps and I'm a very positive person. And I always think that once we identify the problem, we all work together to get positions as better in terms of surveillance, in terms of modeling, so that when the next pandemic comes that we are much better prepared in terms of our data infrastructure and modeling infrastructure. So it has been difficult, but I do think that, you know, why I do it, I always give this example that um, sometimes I get emails from these young uh, teenager uh, girls in India who saw me on television and said that, I saw you talking about biostatistics. I do not know anything about it. Can you tell me how can I study biostatistics? So I think that there are so many economists, so many physicians out in front in the media and people know like talking about modeling, which is our work and we know it. And it, in Indian Statistical Institute is a fantastic institute full of statisticians. But when I see media news coverage in terms of television, I do not see quantitative people. So that was another thing that we need to be at the table. There needs to be a presence. But also this really helped me to talk about biostatistics and during the pandemic, Zoom has really opened up this global corridor for education and communication. And I could talk to a cohort of women in a village in India, watching me on their phone talking about biostatistics. So I think that's the, that's the biggest thing which kept me going, that I can actually be a spokesperson for what we do. Um, yeah. 
Thank you for because I was going to ask you a, a, a question along this line as well. In a way, building on what has been achieved to actually, you know, bring the importance of, of data and and of good statistics and, and good analysis and how important that the impact it has on people's life. You know, and it's not just a. Um, theoretical. So you demonstrate that uh, perfectly. Um, there's a question, a more technical question uh, by Diva Sakineti about why did you choose this ESR for this data? What, why was it your first uh, project? Yeah. yeah, so so the first thought was just convenience. We started on March 16th and our first projections went out by March 2020. So we needed something which was in-house that we knew a lot about, right? Because the Wuhan modeling was being done. And so we had some uh, data in terms of how to choose prior parameters, right? Because built on some of the things that we saw uh, in that structure, we actually had a prior on are not later on we changed all of this because as new variants emerged and new generation times and new uh, parameters were identified but initially we only had the Wuhan data and because Dr. Song's lab who is my colleague was already working on this there was just taking that and transporting to the India data and also at a national level in India very limited data is still available. That's one thing that I really wanted to point out. This is not like the data-rich environment of the Western world we are talking about. We really have case counts, death counts, and recoveries. Till this date, you cannot get an estimate of how many people are hospitalized with COVID before vaccination and after vaccination because there is not an integrated data system. All you can get is very sporadic network, hospital network data, uh, where the like private hospital system. So this is uh, this is to some extent I have to say is true for the United States as well, because we also do not have national health system so that to give us real national data on what percentage of breakthrough infections or what percentage of hospitalization. For India to break down the model into various components even in terms of mobility, agent sex structure, hospitalization, everything that you do is going to require a lot of parameter specifications and that's just not available. So that's why I say that we can come up with all of these wonderful models, but if we do not have the data to fit them, what is their use? They, are, they should be there. And we sh I do think that we should aspire to get the data to do justice to these models, but we are just not there. So that led to simpler models with simpler data that's nationally available. But then for hotspots in some of the states, we had more curated data, and that's what we used in some of the state-specific models. Um, but then, you know, the, as I said, that later on, we divided the compartments when we had more data in terms of fatalities, in terms of what quality of tests were being used, we expanded it. But the basic model has been in terms of what is routinely available at a national level and what is common for each of the states. And then there are state specific models. So uh, that was our, that was sort of what sort of prompted. I'd have to say that, you know, when I started out, you can see that my desk is now filled with like books on how to model epidemics because I I, I just did not know, right? This is a, a blind journey, a mad and mad pursuit that I was, I, I was working on observational data, electronic health records and so on. But when the pandemic hit, it just, this was a strange call that I wanted to do something. And what else can a statistician do except to try out these different models and try to learn? So this has been an amazing journey in terms of learning. Thank you. Um, I, I want to, yeah, I, want, I was wondering if the fact, you know, there's some, there's the rural and the city contrasts, but, you know, you, you, yes. you, you know, so the things were happening in, in these massive cities, and then there's also most of the population is in very rural area. I mean, did you, in a way, you you averaged over all that when you were yeah. doing? But did you did you feel there was something could be done? You probably have the fraction of times versus rural. I mean, did did did, did you think about? of taking this into account somehow or did it make any difference in the way because you were at a very high level of modeling? Yeah, so I think it's a statistical sin 
to build a model for India as a nation because it is so heterogeneous. It's so diverse. If you just take the case counts and model and come up with projections, it's just an error because you, 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 you cannot do that. In the beginning, of course, we did not have data, right? So we only had national level case counts. We had to go with that. But um, even in terms of the timing of the, it's impossible to predict, like, you know, I, I think it's almost uh, nonsensical to predict the peak in the country because different parts of India goes through these waves and then different, like it's a cascade of waves, right? So first, almost always it happens into the port cities and the gateway of India in Maharashtra and Mumbai, and then it goes, spreads to the inner cities and Maharashtra and Kerala first, and then you see in Delhi, and then you see in Calcutta. And so it's really uh, the, the national data almost masks the, so you, you, you feel like, okay, the national peak has passed and you relax your guards, but the peak is coming in another small part of the, like, you know, so, so the regional modeling is absolutely critical because the timing and how the, how the virus spreads. So 1.4 billion people, 18% of the world's population in a country. So you have to really think about different models at a granular level. And that's why I think that I have been focusing so much on getting more data at a subnational level and beyond the urban metros because we really need that in order to get a good model which takes a district level model and then builds from the lower air resolution units to the high resolution because there is absolutely no point in modeling the whole overall global trajectory. Yeah. And also the surveillance systems are also of different quality, testing, for example, right? So this all along, this has really bothered me that who is getting tested, because that is the data on which your model is built. And that's so subject to selection and sampling, sampling bias. And in rural areas, the nearest testing center, you have to travel two or three hours almost sometimes. So obviously people are not accessing testing. Um, I know my friends who are in the like, you know, who live in um, higher mountainous regions, they have to go and they are just quarantining. They're not reporting their tests, they have symptoms. So all of these things make it really important to take all. So there have been some models, some machine learning models where you take all of these covariates, which are predictive of the reported, how much is being reported, right? In each area, testing, the intensity, the public health interventions. And I think that that's the, way to go to when we do not have observed data, what are the pre-pandemic variables, what happened during the pandemic, and um, to use those to come up with reasonable predictions, because the access to healthcare is widely, widely different. So that's all. Even, even if I build models from different regions and build up, the selection bias of reported case counts have to be it's just major, massive. Philip, you had the yeah, I, I mean, just uh, it was interesting. You referred to the 1.4 billion people. It, it, it really struck me that is in India did is so in, in England where you know uh, the UK is a relatively small place, and and our our sort of interventions were very much taken on nationally as a sort of coming together. It struck me when you said you can't. You know, uh, India is very um, heterogeneous. Is that the case in terms of people's attitudes to how they reacted to um, non-pharmaceutical inventions or was, or was there a sort of sense of one nation there as well? So I think that in the beginning, um, it was just, we do not know anything about this virus. Let us buy some time to figure out what we are going to do. I think the initial lockdown was probably prompted by not really reducing transmission. Because I have been to some very remote areas in India where people are just wondering why they cannot go and open their shops and have, do not have their income when there is not a single case in the village, right? So they, they, they just think that like, what is this like, you know, urban people doing? to our living and livelihood. So there has always been this uh, dialogue between lives and livelihoods. And so that's again why I think it's really, really important to set up surveillance system. If you don't have a surveillance system, 
at a national level with a nice fraction of cases sequence, then you can be at a much more peace of mind. I think that what you, you have a track on what is going on you, and you can be very strategic and targeted. But also mobility restrictions in India is hard, right? If you actually have an outbreak in one part, then certain other parts will always be affected because there is a lot of mobility. But there are some remote areas. You are absolutely right. It has to be really targeted um, in terms of where the nature of the outbreak is. So whether, whether it's you, you have, so in the second wave, actually, instead of uh, national measures, we saw localized measures, right? After, but it was too late after things have already picked up. Is that real? It's very hard to convince people that you have to intervene on that low part of the curve when it has, you don't see the trajectory yet. Once you have seen the uptick, it's already probably too late. That timing is the key more than the intervention. But I think a local, that's why, this having these public health interventions studied at a granular level all across India, so that you have a sort of mechanism to think about what is the natural realm of variation specific to our location and seasonality and all of the other things taken together is extremely, extremely important. Surveillance is extremely important. Yeah. I think maybe a, a, a final question. You've been speaking, uh, you know, very, um, energetically question what do you what do you think needs to happen now so this is looking for the future in terms of preparing modeling for future pandemics yes so i i really think that it has i think this is a great time for us to reflect and look at all of the data that we have gathered. Um, I think that initially it was this madness of producing results and answers in a matter of a couple of weeks. But now I think there is time to think about more carefully about the future. And I, I, I think that estimating the public health intervention effect from this all these natural experiments that happened all over the world uh, is extremely interesting to me. Some of this classical, you know, the causal inference in terms of matching, in terms of controlling for confounding, in terms of matching areas which are similar uh, in terms of geography, in terms of interventions, and really teasing apart. Uh, I do not know because every intervention is rolled out in a bundle. And that's why we went into the tier because we cannot tease apart the isolated effect of facial covering, the single effect, because it's it's I could not find where because they are not really rolled out. That's why we went to the tiered modeling. So how to really think about taking this data in and thinking about public health intervention framework, because there has been some rightful criticism of um, interventions, for example, in India, night curfew, just night curfew or restricting the store hours, which made people frantic about going to stores during those hours. Rather than restricting hours, keeping them open with the lower capacity is a better intervention. So, but so all of these little tweaks that you can do to really humanize the public health intervention measures and make it implementation-wise, right? So, yeah, yeah, sorry. I think one big job ahead is to carefully analyze now, basically. Yeah try to but I mean it's hard to compare countries because even the way when you say you know this mask wearing was introduced as mask wearing and how people wear masks and how their adherence it, and you know the, the social context is very different between India and, and Denmark you know so um, even you know to do, to, to do you need variability so you need to go cross country or, or you know you need some vari variation otherwise you can't uh, you, you you definitely need to stay, see this across geography and there is very little work in like you know and, and, and cultural difference between countries it's yes hard work. but you think that's never the very important thing to now do to be prepared I, I think it's very important and the covid survivorship cohorts because we see this you know long covid was such a ill-measured concept till there was a clinical case definition put forward by who. And now I think that there are so many follow-up studies of COVID really to uh, set up survivorship cohorts so that we can really fully appreciate the effect of COVID and not just on health, but on education, on mental health, on other things where there are so many causal questions that I can see that statisticians and we can get engaged in terms of 
um, setting up a robust system. But for low and middle income countries, setting up integrated data systems and surveillance systems, I think is the key models come after. Phil, do you want to con conclude? Yeah, I mean, you know, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Brahma. Um, uh, just a few, uh, and, you know, thank you to you and your whole team, uh, the pictures you put up at the start, you know, all this stuff is a real team effort. Um, and it's great, great to hear uh, such interesting, um, such an interesting talk uh, in terms of housekeeping. Um, there's a couple of messages in the chat about can people please complete the feedback survey. Uh, the link is in there. The next lecture is uh, from Public Health Wales. Uh, so a bit of a smaller country, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be absolutely fascinating as well. Um, Registration is open, so please, please join in and do, you know, Follow us on social media. Uh, so let's have a get a conversation going on this on Twitter. Uh, and I think the, the link is also in the chat. So yeah, once again, thank you from me. Absolutely fascinating and really, really interesting. So thank yeah. you. Thank you for all your work and for coming today and, and really for all your work for many people must be very grateful. And no, thank you so much. I'm very thankful to the organizers and all being part of this uh, afternoon. So thank you to the audience. Thank you all of you.